Our special guest for today is Michelle Strobel, Regional Manager of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, Care Management at Partners Health Management, and founder of Breed Wellness Counseling. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here as well. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, because I know you are busy. <laughs> I know you're busy. <laughs> Good stuff. Yes, I am. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Well, listen, um, got some questions for you here um, and from our, from our audience. Can you provide an overview of intellectual and developmental disabilities and how they might intersect with trauma in patients? Sure, absolutely. So when we think about intellectual and developmental disabilities, this is a really um, diverse group of chronic conditions uh, mm -hmm. that are due to mental and or physical impairments in patients. Okay. So when we think about an intellectual disability, this is usually somebody that involves that has limitations involving their intellectual functioning, mm -hmm. meaning that their IQ is usually below 70. Okay. And they also have limitations in adaptive behaviors and their social behaviors. Hmm. So a developmental disability, okay. that is a even broader category. So okay. it includes those folks with the intellectual disability, but it brings in people with physical disabilities as well. Hmm. So within this group, this is where you usually see those folks that physical di disabilities are manifested before like the age of 22. And it can include like cerebral palsy, autism spectrum disorders, Down syndrome, um, and even traumatic brain injuries that happen prior mm -hmm. to the age of 22. So you'll hear intellectual developmental disability paired together a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is two separate categories of okay. patients. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarity there. Why is it crucial to address trauma in individuals with IDD? Absolutely. So when you look at the intersection of trauma and IDD, it is very complex and it is a very important issue because people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. they are more vulnerable to experience trauma. Mm -hmm. And because of the limitations that come either from their cognitive limitations or their adaptive limitations and even their physical limitations, mm -hmm. then they face very unique challenges when it comes to coping and recovering from these traumatic experiences. Okay, okay. Are there like specific types of trauma that are more prevalent in this population that you've seen or have researched? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so people with IDD, um, they're at, like I was saying earlier, they're at a greater risk of experiencing trauma than just your general population. And research actually points to that anywhere from 65% to 75% of people with IDD have had at least one traumatic experience in their lifetime. And our and research is telling us that the general population, those numbers are between 51 and 61%. So they are at this increased risk. And when you think about trauma, I love mm -hmm. to think when I'm talking about trauma, I think about um, Francine Shapiro, right? She was that American okay. psychologist. She developed right. um, EMDR, so eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. And she introduced a concept of trauma that's called big T and little t. And so when you think about big T traumas, so those are those major like traumatic events that um often are very life-threatening. They propose a significant risk to the person. Mm -hmm. um, and most people, when they see these big T's, they kind of can identify like, oh, wow, yeah, that's a huge, that's huge trauma, right? Yeah, that's huge so this trauma. is where you're seeing, <laughs> yeah, it's huge trauma. There is a difference. Is there it? is a difference. There is, there is. So that's like, you know, natural disasters, war, accidents, mm -hmm. um, physical, sexual assault, abuse, right? That's those big, big T traumas. Mm -hmm. So little T traumas, these are those like, it's, less severe, but they're still very distressing. Mm -hmm. And it's events that kind of fall outside the normal human experience. And um, with these, these are those traumas that are kind of like bullying, emotional abuse, chronic illness, ongoing medical procedures and abandonment, right? Okay. So when we think about big T and little t trauma, I always have to preface this with just because it's a little t trauma doesn't mean that it's not trauma, right? So it's just Absolutely. a way to kind of 
distinguish. Yeah, absolutely. So did, yes. So when we're talking about our patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they are more prone to those little T traumas at a very, very high rate. Okay. So mm -hmm. they see bullying throughout their school, throughout their adulthood, lots of social isolation, right? Um, right. Institutionalization yeah. mm -hmm. happens a lot for our folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and honestly, uh, Dr. Baldwin, when we think about a person with IDD, mm -hmm. because of the limitations, both adaptive and right. cognitive, mm -hmm. most of these patients are receiving some sort of support um, through the disability service system, correct? Correct. Just because of that fact alone, their risk of abuse is increased by 78%. That's huge. That is huge. huge. Yeah. That is huge. Wow. Mm, yeah, that, that, that that's pretty huge. That's, I was going to, that was, as you're asking a question, I'm like, it's going to be a little bit smaller, but 78% is, is, uh, yeah. Alarming and concerning. So. Very much. And when you think about the disability service system, this is where people go for help, right? Mm -hmm. And just by fact of reaching out for help, right. their increase for abuse is just exponentially increased. Mm. What barriers do individuals with IDD face when seeking mental health or trauma-informed care? Lots of barriers, <laughs> lots of barriers. Uh, there are barriers um, that range everywhere from just access, um, finding providers that have the correct knowledge and training to be able to support someone with um, cognitive and, a, and um, adaptive limitations and differences. Uh, and lots of times, one of the biggest barriers, especially when we're thinking about trauma and trauma treatment, is around diagnosis mm. um, because it is so difficult to diagnose someone who has IDD. Because when we think about the typical diagnosis of trauma or you know like acute stress disorder or post traumatic stress disorder, it involves the patient really being able to, to communicate and recall, have this memory recall of that traumatic experience. Well, when our folks and our patients with intellectual developmental disabilities experience trauma. One of the diagnostic criteria for IDD is that they have those limitations in communication and memory recall. So it is very difficult to diagnose hmm. patients with IDD and trauma, which then impedes treatment hmm. because without a diagnosis, it's hard to do proper treatment. How can healthcare providers overcome these barriers to ensure effective treatment? So when we think about providing effective treatment. Um, it's going to really take a multifaceted approach, mm -hmm. right? It's, and this approach is going to have to include policy reform. It's going to have to include increased funding for these specialized services that these patients need. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to have to include training for those healthcare providers, public awareness campaigns, and even, you know, just the reduction around stigma itself and seeking out treatment. Mm -hmm. So when we think about this, you know, you really would want to look at how do we enhance coordination between those mental health providers and those IDD services? Because what we see historically in the healthcare system here in the United States is those two lanes of service systems are very siloed. And we have to figure out how to... Okay. Yeah, they're very siloed. And okay. so we have to figure out how to get those two communities in the service system talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by doing this, we can help to improve that accessibility. We can look at tailoring interventions that are very specific to the needs of our patients with IDD, mm -hmm. and then really provide a unique service array for mm -hmm. these folks and helping them to really get that adequate mental health care that is needed to be able to treat trauma. Thank you for sharing that. How can healthcare providers effectively communicate with individuals with IDD about trauma? So this, this is really, uh, again, it's, it's multifaceted. So when we think about, um, mm -hmm. 
our patients with IDD, providers are going to have to really work is work more on a team approach. This is really going to be more mm -hmm. team type care mm -hmm. because lots of times our folks with um, intellectual developmental disabilities, those patients, they require support and their caregivers oftentimes help them to understand. And so we can't just, you know, rely on being able to have communications with the patient. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to start bringing in the people who support that patient as well. Right. So right. it's going to involve, you know, being patient. Mm -hmm. It's going to involve really kind of this like understanding of there may be more people that you're communicating with than just the patient and really just being adaptable, you know, mm -hmm. like just being adaptable and being able to change up the way that you talk to folks and mm -hmm. being very clear and concrete in the communication that you're delivering. Clear and concrete. Mm -hmm. Clear and concrete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are some trauma-informed treatment approaches tailored for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities? So I'll tell you, this is this is one of those things that gives me a little bit of heartburn. Um, because there are treatment uh, approaches out there. There are modalities out there that have been adapted. The research for how these modalities um, are effective with your IDD population is very, very limited. Okay. I will say we have grown a lot in the past, I would say five years. There's more out there. It is still very limited. Um, with that being said, they are starting to look more into the effectiveness of these evidence-based um, interventions for IDD and trauma. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking at right now is really, um, it's like your, your cognitive behavioral therapy, so your CBT. Right. Okay. They're looking at adaptions in that, as well as your dialectical behavioral therapy oh. and how to modify and adapt those therapies. And usually that really just involves um, more of like the way that you are introducing concepts, right? Gotcha. Making sure that gotcha. your um, right. communication style really meets mm -hmm. the style of that patient. Right. Um, they also are doing research now in like sensory processing approaches. Mm -hmm. um, play therapy, huge, huge for this population. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, I get when I say play therapy, sometimes when I'm talking to people about therapeutic interventions, they're like, well, these are adults. And I'm like, yes, and adults play. Adults play. We sure and do. So we, that's <laughs> right. That's right. That's how, you know, that's how we keep yeah. ourselves healthy. Yeah. We yeah. play. Play is right. so important. Um, and then, of course, there's those adaptations in art and music therapy. And you heard me talking about Francine Shapiro earlier. They are definitely doing some research on EMDR and its effectiveness in patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. So how can a multidisciplinary approach be beneficial when addressing trauma in this population? I heard you mentioned about team, but, uh, you know, what's some, some multidisciplinary approach that'd be beneficial? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it takes a village, <laughs> Dr. Baldwin, it takes a village. Yeah. Um, and especially when you're thinking about our patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. So right. we want to make sure that we are um, including those professionals from just various disciplines mm -hmm. um, across, you know, the service array. So make sure mm -hmm. that we're including, you know, psychology professionals in there, uh, psychiatry, social workers, Social workers are huge, making sure they're part of the team and having conversations because they they know the resources, right? They know the resources. Mm -hmm. Occupational therapy, um, speech and language um, professionals, special education professionals, mm -hmm. care management. Care management is huge mm -hmm. with uh, patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And having that team approach really is the best way to address trauma within gotcha our IDD patients. Gotcha, gotcha. What role can caregivers, families, and support networks play in preventing and addressing trauma in individuals with IDD? Absolutely. Um, 
I've said this multiple times and you'll hear me say it a hundred times before we're finished. Mm -hmm. It takes, it, it takes a village. It takes a village. So when we think about our patients with IDD, they rely so much on those family members or those caregivers, their friends, their support network, because that's where they get um, some of the uh, support that maybe our adults that don't have these type of limited um, abilities in their cognition or their, their um, adaptive functioning, that comes from the people who are surrounding them. So right. it is very important that we are engaging these um, caregivers, these support networks in that therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. We need to, as we are, you know, discussing trauma with our IDD patient, we also need to make sure that we're discussing that with their caregivers and their support networks so that they understand that how, how trauma is impacting this person that they're caring for um, and what that might look like for them and how can they then help that person through their healing journey of handling um, and growing through the trauma experience that they've had. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Are, are there community-based initiatives or resources that can contribute to um, uh, tr like trauma prevention? So once again, Dr. Baldwin, these resources, especially for our IDD patients, are very, mm -hmm. very limited, very okay. limited. Okay. Um, one of the biggest resources that I often will um, direct professionals to, as well as families and caregivers, it's the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Oh, they okay. are, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. they are doing lots and lots of great work with um, addressing trauma in um, children and looking at our ACEs, so those adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And they are actually one of the few um, trauma prevention organizations that has developed a toolkit for addressing trauma with patients. Um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Michelle, are there legal or ethical considerations that healthcare providers need to be aware of when working with individuals with ID who have experienced trauma? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the biggest things I think about when I'm thinking about those legal and ethical considerations is it's around consent and capacity, right? Because when we are providing treatment for folks, um, when we are looking at supporting any patient, we have to provide um, informed consent, right? Let them know what they're getting into and what this looks like. And with our patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, not only do we have to provide that informed consent, mm -hmm. we also have to ensure the capacity is there right. to understand that informed right. consent. So we need to make sure that as, you know, as the provider, if you are supporting someone with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, you want to ensure that you are presenting your information in a very understandable way mm -hmm. to that person with IDD. Um, and this, you know, could include, maybe you use very simplified language, maybe use visual aid. Vi vis visual aids really um, benefit people who have like cognitive um, limitations. Mm -hmm. So that's a great way to support them and helping them to understand what they're consenting to. Mm -hmm. And then of course, always reaching out because a lot of our patients with IDD will have a guardian, not all of them, mm -hmm. but some of them will have a, a you know, a um, LRP or, you know, a guardian. So that uh, legally represented person. Okay. Okay. And if you're getting informed consent, we need to make sure we're getting the informed consent from the patient. And if they mm. have a guardian, we also need to make sure we're getting that consent from that guardian or advocate. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, thank you. How can we ensure that the rights of these individuals with IDD are protected throughout the treatment process? Absolutely. So for our patients with limited capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Providers should always always involve them to the greatest extent possible in their decision-making. We want to always make sure that we are including the patient in conversations, that we are including the patient and seeking out their 
their like their thoughts on mm-hmm. you know treatment and things like that even if in the past we have not gotten a whole lot of feedback from mm-hmm. the patient themselves mm-hmm. we still with every turn need to make sure that we are including them right. um, and giving them the opportunity to participate in their healthcare uh, decisions to the greatest extent possible and it can look like you know maybe we're using like supported decision making models maybe those family members and those guardians and those advocates are there and are part of those conversations but we always want to make sure that that patient is involved and can provide their thoughts and their feedback to their treatment Mm-hmm. all at all terms mm-hmm. all right thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. um, one thing I've, I've i've you know repeatedly heard you say that um you know there's like a lack of uh research as far as mm-hmm. trauma is concerned so that's oh, yeah. it's so wide open and lane i'm glad that you uh are out there uh, keeping this as a focus um, um for our patients with idd so with the gaps that exist, like in current research in trauma, uh, where should like future efforts be focused as far as research and advocacy concerned? Absolutely. Yeah. So I will say I, I'm excited that mm-hmm. it is growing, like research is growing, but there is still very, very significant gaps. And mm-hmm. these will definitely have to be addressed to help us better understand the impacts of trauma on our patients with IDD, as well as how to support them. Um, So when I'm thinking about the future and where research really needs to like hone in on Mm -hmm. screening tools and assessment. Screening tools, gotcha, gotcha. Right, screening tools and assessment. There are not very many, many validation, validated tools. Uh, for screening for trauma and for assessing trauma in the IDD population. Actually, Mm -hmm. I did not know none existed and from my research up until two weeks ago. I finally found, yeah, I finally found one tool, none, none, um, that were specifically validated on our IDD patients, right? There was none. Right. So two weeks ago, I did find one tool that um, is coming out of the UK and uh, it's uh, in the process of being completely validated. Mm. Right. So it's, you know, it's, there's so, it's so limited. And now I will say um, providers have been using existing tools, right? Like we've been making adaptations to tools. I have a a tool that I use in my own practice where I look at uh, depression as part of, you know, their traumatic experience. And I take the uh, PHQ-9 and I have it like pictures. And that's how I've been utilizing that to assess that piece of it with my patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as far as actually like true tools to um, look at, the assessment of trauma up until about two weeks ago, I didn't know of any. (laughs) So yeah, so it's, it's, they're growing, which is nice, which is nice. Uh, Another place of course, that I was talking about is those Mm -hmm. intervention strategies, right? We definitely need to spend more um, of our focus in research on these evidence-based practices and their adaptation for our IDD population. And what is the effectiveness of that? Uh, you know, when you look at research now, they tell us, you know, we can adapt, but there's not a whole lot of research that tells us what the effectiveness looks like when we do adapt those treatment models. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, you know, also another piece of it is this, what, what I call the inclusive, like research practices. Mm-hmm. So historically in research, patients with IDD have not been included. So they get ruled out or they get passed over. Um, not included. Because, yeah, they're just not included in the research at all. Mm-hmm. They're one of the 
the criteria if somebody if you have a patient present with an intellectual developmental disability that's going to be one of the exclusion criteria for research so we yeah, need yeah, yeah. yes yes so we need this more inclusive research practice and uh, allowing our patients with idd to um, be part of research Correct. and Correct. <laughs> you know to be able to understand right like what is how how do they um fare in the research and what does the effectiveness looks like them and then that also when you think about that with the the idd it also the intersectionality of idd with like race gender yep. sexual orientation socioeconomic mm -hmm. status and how all of those things mm -hmm. then influence the experience of trauma and their access to care. Absolutely, absolutely. Michelle, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule um, to, you know, give us more insight and focus uh, for our population, our, our IDD population, uh, as it relates to trauma. Um, I'm glad that you're one of the leading voices that we see out here around the country um, in this specific area. So, um, learned a lot today. I learned a lot today, even though I'm hosting this podcast and all this good stuff, you know, uh, some stuff I, you know, had got an idea about, but it's a lot I didn't know, but, uh, thank you for, for pointing this out to us. Um, we look forward to your continued work, uh, and research and, and being a part of that movement to ensure that, um, um, our IDD patients are getting the appropriate uh, recognition, um, the appropriate treatment, and the uh, the appropriate advocacy on all fronts to ensure that they're included in in uh, as far as practice and and research uh, to improve health you know pretty much health outcomes period um, just like everybody else <laughs> just like yes. everyone else is getting right now so. Glad that you're the voice. Glad that you're the voice. And we look forward to more conversations with you. Um, being the, you know, one of the leading voices uh in this focus here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um just appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'm very passionate um in working with our patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and yes, I'm humbled. I'm humbled to be part of the movement and that can help those without a voice have a voice. Right. And, and, you know, as a DBH, you, you are doing that thing. So you're definitely, um, as we say, in the, uh, yeah, finding <laughs> the need, fill, filling in the gap and, you know, pretty much addressing that need. So I, I appreciate you being out there. Thank you. All right, to our audience, thank you for coming. Um, you've been a great, uh, these are great questions that you're you're giving us uh, here to ask Ms. Strobel and continue, please continue to like, share, and subscribe to our podcast for more enlightening aspects of uh, care for our patients and integrated healthcare as we continue to push this integrated care movement as we prepare for the value-based care. So thank you. Again, Michelle, we will see you again. We're going to have more conversation. Thank you. All right. And to our audience, we'll see you at the next podcast.